So yeah, hi everybody. My name is Gleb Smolnik. Uh, I'm working for uh, BI and Azure cluster uh, for uh, Center of Excellence, uh, so sort of obviously, yeah. And uh, yeah, kind of, you know, I. What what is the idea behind yeah the, this the whole the whole the whole the whole presentation yeah I had a project with some client some couple of months ago. <laughs> Unfortunately, at that time I was not so uh, experienced and proficient in the subject as I am now. Uh, hopefully, yeah. So uh, after the project uh, finished, I just tried to actually you know uh, investigate uh, a bit. Uh, the subject a bit deeper by myself. Um, yeah, and uh, so I spent a couple of months to actually, you know, try to uh, try to come up with the best way how to run Spark on Kubernetes, uh, actually in Azure. Uh, why in Azure? Because as you might know, Kubernetes is uh, like sourced by Google, so it is a Google child. And uh, if we talk about, for example, Google, uh, if we talk about uh, cloud implementation of Kubernetes, there's a lot of documentation, for example, for uh, Google Kubernetes engine, yeah? Uh, and also there's a lot of like articles how to run Spark on top of it. Uh, however, if we talk about Azure, uh, I believe there is kind of lack of documentation and therefore, I just wanted to come up with some, uh, you know, missing points to cover those points, and you know, create rule of thumbs for uh, for people to to actually follow. So you know, so they could they could build their applications uh, on Kubernetes in Azure. Yeah. So let me start. Unfortunately, <laughs> I just you know, after the forward, I I, I need to mention. The, some of my one of my demos, I have three demos today planned, is not working properly. <laughs> I was struggling all the morning why it is not working. Uh, but yeah, I will try to fix it uh, while we will actually, you know, we'll um, track some progress of our jobs or stuff. So hopefully it will work. Presentation is also not very big. I will try to be as much. Mm, you know, interactive as possible to show you some links, some sites, some articles I I found interesting and also valuable. And after the presentation, after this meeting, I will probably just, you know, uh, fulfill the presentation with all the links, also create a blog post uh, as it is always done, yeah, and share it within conference. Okay, so let's start. Uh, from the agenda, so, uh, I will try to cope, uh, you know, within one hour. So at least my uh, gut feeling tells me that it is possible to tell about everything planned today within a one hour. As you see, it is quite tight schedule. So it sums up to 65 minutes. Um, yeah, so I left QA to the till the end. However, uh, I believe, uh, you know, if it is very, very urgent topic and, for example, you know, you really need to ask it right now, go ahead, shoot. Uh, but, but yeah, as planned, Q&A session is mentioned uh, at the end of the presentation, as, at, at the end of the presentation. So, uh, if it is not something not very urgent or some general uh, stuff, so let's just wait until the end. So, the agenda of the day is, um, we, go, we will go through the overall motivation behind the subject and some basic con con concepts, uh, vocabulary and this kind of stuff. Um, we, will, um, uh, we, will, we will review reference architecture. So this is actually like my, it, it, is, uh, it is my idea of how the reference architecture for this kind of project or for this kind of system would look like. So I will uh, go through it and uh, speak about it uh, for a couple of minutes as well. I will show you first demo. So during first demo, we'll go through very basic Spark documentation. So, you know, how it is, how it is, uh, how it is described in Spark documentation. Uh, I will show you some resources, how it is, you know, what are the resources in clouds that I use and, and other stuff. 
Um, yeah, all, after that, I will um, just concentrate a bit closer on those Azure services um, integration. Yeah, so how it is done, what are common like patterns, hard to implement because there are different ways, obviously. I will demo uh, my second piece related to this peer part. Uh, hopefully, I will fix it. Uh, because it is two part demo, so part number two is not working uh, currently, yeah, but, but yeah. Um, and yeah, we'll talk through a bit uh, about orchestration. Um, and yeah, it is con kind of controversial for me, but yeah, let's just wait until this, this part and I will describe what I mean by controversial. Uh, the latest uh, finding, findings, further readings, and notable mentions. I didn't uh, finalize this section in the presentation right now, but I will. Uh, I will do it uh, as you know, as we as we as we finish the, the meeting. So I will add all the links, all the presentation I was preparing and I was reading through this journey. Yeah? First, let's concentrate on what will be not covered. Uh, I will not cover any kind of comparison and optimization techniques because uh, it is not, uh, it was not my original idea. So uh, the idea today behind today was mostly to talk about architectural stuff, how to integrate Spark and AQAs with other different Azure services, how to create products and systems. So it is not about, you know, I will go and compare Yarn and the speed of HDFS with uh, Kubernetes and how it's working. So I believe that for this presentation, it is out of scope. I will also not cover any, so it is kind of, you know, flowing through the first, uh, from, from the first, uh, from the first item. So I will not cover any auto scaling, uh, because it is more, uh, complex uh, idea and it should be tested sorrowfully. Um, so I did not, uh, did not test it too much. Also, I will not cover Google Spark operator. So today we are going to concentrate mostly on uh, how it is actually written in official documentation. And, um, you know, I was, as I said, I was kind of working, uh, consulting or helping with the project for actual clients. And um, actually, you know, they, they were basing on this official documentation approach and it was fitting their purposes perfectly. So I thought that probably I will also concentrate on that, but I will mention this Google Spark operator in the end, and I will try to talk through some core differences between uh, Google Spark operator and uh, you know, the approach that I will, I will show. So yeah, why, why Spark on Kubernetes? <laughs> First of all, because it's possible, yeah, because uh, um, you know, it was it was uh, introduced. So, Spark was generally uh, linked with uh, you know in 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 overall in, in developers had in data engineers had that uh, Spark should run on Hadoop, yeah, or kind of you know uh, distributed system. So there should be some I don't know Hadoop distribution should be HDFS. There should be master slave architecture and other kind of you know this. Uh, and other under other concepts like that. However, Kubernetes, you know, after it was added in version 2.3, it's written here. Um, you know, it actually added a bit, um, a bit different way, a bit different perspective of how to run Spark, because as you might know, in Kubernetes, you do not have a strict uh, master node and you know other different services that are on Yard. You do not have HDFS out of the box at least on Kubernetes. Uh, if you want, you could build one, but yeah, it is it is not available from the scratch. So uh, yeah, it is you know kind of interesting way of how to run Spark. Yeah, uh, why Spark? So basically, I, I believe everybody on this call knows about Spark. So that Spark is unified analytics engine for large scale data processing and it is massively distributed and it works, uh, it does all the computations in memory and it's super fast and super fancy and everybody is excited with Spark. Um, yeah, so as I said, Kubernetes support was added um, 
uh, in version 2.3, currently actual version, so 2.3, it's like two years ago, yeah? Current version is 3.0, and, uh, you know, actually newer versions uh, add more and more functionality. Obviously, uh, it still lacks a couple of concepts uh, I will also talk a bit about it in in a second. That are available for Yarn and for or for methods for you know those Hadoop uh, implementations, yeah. But uh, you know developers are constantly working on improvements, on bug fixing, on development. So you know actually there is a lot of work uh, dedicated to you know to develop this piece with uh, Kubernetes as a resource manager, yeah. And um, yeah, so the last point is why, why Kubernetes actually, yeah, because uh, I, I, I read a number of articles, yeah, that, uh, you know, it is horrifying how, how it is, how it is, how it is um, complicated to manage dependencies or, I don't know, run your isolated code inside Yarn, yeah, because you have a lot of different other applications that are working on your uh, machines or your nodes. So, you know, you need to deal with that. With Spark on Kubernetes, you actually are, you know, you are free of the subject eh? because uh, application is containerized. You include only what you need into the container and basically this is it. Uh, so, as you might understand that, uh, you know, uh, dependency management uh, is uh, kind of simpler uh, comparing to Yarn yeah, and to Hadoop implementation. And uh, yeah, also, you know, this uh, buzz uh, in nowadays microservices, architectures, Kubernetes. So Spark is actually, you know, kind of also implementing and making it possible to implement this kind of architectures uh, for, for, for uh, you know, for different systems and applications, yeah. Um, yeah, and it could be cheaper sometimes. Didn't check it, um, you know, in in a deep in a deep way, but it could be. Yeah. Um, yeah. Basic vocabulary. Let's just go through some uh, through some uh, you know definitions. Uh, if somebody is not aware of what's going on with you know containerization and Kubernetes, especially. So for Spark, three. Uh, like the most uh, important here are driver and executor and cluster or resource manager. So driver is a, a application which or process which runs code, spins up uh, Spark, Spark context and you know manage executors. Um, so you know you you actually when you execute your code, it is going through driver and it instructs uh, executors what to do next. Uh, executor is a process which actually does job, so run tasks, uh, keep data somewhere in memory, on you know spills it to disks, whatever. And uh, cluster manager, so it is abstraction. I would say it is abstraction of the process uh, which manages cluster resources. Yes, yeah, so Spark uh, enables core resource managers. Yes, yeah, so standalone Spark. Uh, the basic one, yes, yeah, so also two uh, uh, related to Hadoop. Yeah, so first first one could be also related to Hadoop, but anyway, yeah, so yeah, and Mezes uh, are those two uh, after standalone, and the fourth one is actually Kubernetes, yeah. So uh, cluster manager actually communicates with drivers and executors, and it listens to driver, you know, uh, needs and demand for resources and tries to fulfill those needs. Yeah. Um, after after discussing Spark, so let's move on to containerization. What is containerization? Yeah. So, and why containers are so, so cool? So, container is a standardized unit with software packed into it. It means that uh, you basically, uh, uh, if we talk about Docker, obviously you write a file. It is a special language available for Docker. Uh, a special expression language yeah, and files are often called Docker files, and you actually inside those files mention all the all the software and all the files and all the libraries you need to include to this container. Yeah, so you want to base on Ubuntu, go with it. You want to base on some other image, go with it. You want to I don't know install some library, 
you could do it. You could want to, if you want to copy some local files, you could obviously also do it. And uh, yeah, the most like popular, I would say, containing like you know platform for building and managing and deployment of containers currently it is Docker. Uh, so in my in my presentation, I will concentrate on Docker. Uh, so, just you know, in short words, containers allow to isolate our code and you know pack it. So it is you know self. Uh, uh, it is it, it is self fulfilling. So it just you know it is able to do what it needs to do without any other you know additional installations or whatever. And what is Kubernetes? So Kubernetes is actually a system. Uh, yeah, by the way, I'm not uh, a very expert in you know, you know the DevOps subjects and kind of that, so it's my best understanding of those, at least two conversation Kubernetes. So Kubernetes as a system for uh, automating uh, of uh, you know uh, of deployment and scaling and management of containerized stuff. So if you have containers, you obviously need to uh, run those containers, to schedule those containers, to I don't know, terminate those containers, to monitor those containers. Yeah. So Kubernetes actually allows you to do that because uh, it is constructed in a way that it is super powerful, it is super maintainable, it's maintainable and super super monitorable. Yeah. Uh, guys actually did a good you know piece of work. So uh, Kubernetes is actually very very. Uh, very very cool technology for you know this container con container management. Uh, con control plane is it is a component of Kubernetes which hosts the core Kubernetes services like API server and scheduler uh, and a couple of others obviously. And if we talk about Azure Kubernetes services, control plane is is fully managed by Azure. So Azure takes whole responsibility for managing your control plane for maintaining it. And uh, what is like the drawback of it? You do not have too much ability to customize it. For example, install some um, I don't know custom scheduler. Yeah, it is not possible. So because because it is it is it is the it is a piece of uh, Kubernetes managed by Azure. Um, nodes or node pools. Uh, I, I will not right now distinguish too much about it. So it is we could just think about nodes and node pools like physical resources. In case of you know, in case of Azure Kubernetes services, those are obviously VMs uh, that serve uh, some computing power to cluster, and uh, those also uh, host some uh, agent K um, Kubernetes services and other other Kubernetes services that are required for normal Kubernetes Kubernetes fun functionality. Um, pod um, very important piece here, so it is abstraction over an application instance. What this actually means when you execute your application within Kubernetes, when you I don't know write some manifest or just say run this container for me, this container is executed within Pod. So Pod is a uh, mm, this unit of uh, of an application inside Kubernetes cluster. And what's cool about Pod uh, Pods and you know uh, if you might think about virtual machines. For instance, we could have I don't know virtual machine inside node. Let's say we could know we could have nodes for I don't know four uh, cores and 16 giga gigabytes of RAM, uh, and uh, pod could use just only a slight chunk of it, a slight slight piece of it. So you could just say to pod that hey, I want to limit yours. You should request this number of cores and this number of RAM, and I will limit you to this number of cores and this number of RAM. And pod will only consume the the number you de, you you define the here. So uh, it's actually super cool. So uh, as you might think, you could run I don't know hundreds and you know hundred, dozens and hundreds of pods on single node. Yeah, if you manage your uh, resource consumption correctly. Uh, and the last one is manifest. So manifest it is in most cases at least what I, I'm working on and what I uh, uh, what I saw. Uh, it is YAML files with uh, various configuration that is used for deployment. Yeah. As for now, this is it. I will just show you in a minute how these YAML files look like, and it will be probably more, uh, more and more clear for you. Yeah. Um, couple of words on Azure Kubernetes services. So really quick, managed Kubernetes at least control plane is managed many more is also managed by Azure. 
simplifies access and security subjects like integration with Azure AD and Azure uh, role-based access security, enables auto-scaling, uh, provides you know infrastructure, so provides VM skill sets for node pools, and also allows you to use different uh, VMs for node pools, like for example, G GPU enabled if you have some uh, machine learning jobs to, to run, yeah. And yeah, it is certified by Kubernetes. Um, okay, let's move to reference architecture. Um, so it is how I at least imagine it. Um, so let me quickly guide you through it. It starts uh, with the first, which is like local development and configuration management. So let's assume that you have Spark jobs. Uh, it is reference architecture for Spark on Azure Kubernetes service or, or DSO. Let's assume that you develop some Spark jobs locally um, and you, you need to actually, you know, load them somewhere so Spark could fetch those and uh, run those jobs, yeah. Uh, it is pretty simple, so you establish connection between uh, your, you know, local uh, Git and remote Git repository inside, let's say, Azure DevOps, yeah. Then you could set up some, you know, automated build pipelines, yeah, and your code will be pushed to Azure file storage. Mm, I will not cover this piece. And uh, very important here is that, uh, yeah, obviously you could uh, add uh, different configuration files here as well. Uh, why Azure file storage? Because um, it is possible to define um, some abstraction over, over Azure file storage inside Kubernetes. I will talk it through in a, in a well, well, a second demo. And uh, therefore, uh, your pods, which will run Spark code, which will run a Spark program, will have access to this volume and volume will be marked to Azure file storage. So you, for example, for instance, should not include your Spark jobs to inside your uh, Spark image yeah? or your configuration uh, job, uh, configuration files to your Spark image. Yeah? So you could have this isolated Spark image, even, you know, the official one could work, uh, but then you could place, you know, uh, job files and configuration files to a separate location which Spark will have access while execution. So uh, it is kind of division between your code and your configuration management, yeah? Uh, the second part is orchestration, basically. I will cover it in a bit. Uh, <laughs> uh, just a um, background here. I'm, so in Azure, the default way of doing an orchestration, if we talk about some data engineering projects, it is Azure Data Factory, yeah? However, uh, as you might, understand that if you have Azure Kubernetes services, you have Kubernetes, you could spin up anything here. So you could spin up normally your Airflow cluster inside Azure Kubernetes and, you know, do your scheduling, do your orchestration stuff here. However, I just added this, you know, because, because it is just possible. Yeah. And I just wanted to test it. It, uh, <laughs> it took a, a bit of time for me to develop Mm, this orchestrational functionality, I will show it to you while demo. And yeah, it works. It is not perfect, but it works. And uh, yeah, if you, for instance, have some, I don't know, orchestration already inside Azure Data Factory and you want to integrate this in orchestration with your Spark jobs inside Kubernetes, you could do this uh, using these um, additional Azure functions. I will also talk it, uh, about it in, in a sec. Uh, third subject I already covered, so it is about getting dependencies and access some configuration and jobs uh, from um, the storage to Spark, uh, to Spark, to Spark jobs, to Spark pods. Um, fourth one is getting access to business data. Right now it is the one that is not working unfortunately for me, but I would at least show it to you how it should work and how it look, how it should to how it should look like. Uh, so basically you place your data uh, right now for Azure, it is a rule of, uh, you know, it is a standard to work with Azure Data Lake store. Um, and yeah, it is totally possible to connect from your uh, cluster from within Kubernetes to your Azure da Data Lake uh, using some um, Spark configuration. Uh, I will show you in the code how it looks like, at least if it is, uh, <laughs> if it still not work. Um, yeah, number five, secrets management. 
why it is here because you might know that uh, you know you you want for example to use some sensitive information some passport connection strings and this kind of stuff and let's assume e that you do not want to store those directly inside kubernetes uh, because, for for instance, it could be you know double effort to synchronize those between you know Azure Key Vault and your um, Kubernetes cluster secrets. So for this, uh, I also uh, will cover the part with you know secrets management uh, and how it looks like actually. Uh, so we could enable your synchronization between Azure Key Vault and uh, your uh, uh, your Kubernetes secrets. So, you know, pods will consume those secrets and use those. Uh, all right, uh, first demo, let's, let's go, let's try to sp speed up a bit. A bit. So, um, first demo is basically based on, is, is based on, you know, showing the, 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 the documentation and the resources and just simple Spark job that is running uh, right now, uh, that will run on the cluster right now, yeah. So if we, so, what I did obviously initially I go I, to the uh, I, I went to the um, our, our documentation for uh, for Spark and you could find all the answers there. So I just wanted to show you this picture so uh, you will uh, meet it uh, a lot. You will you know if you read some articles uh, over the internet on Spark over on, on the Kubernetes you will meet this picture a lot. So it is the way how uh, actually, you know, uh, Spark interacts with Kubernetes as a resource manager and, uh, you know, how all the underneath work is, uh, underneath logic is implemented. Um, important important uh, thing here is security uh, because uh, first of all, you at least need to create um, uh, you need to create um, a Spark um, Spark uh, service service um, identity or service principle, let's say. Yeah. So yeah, it is covered in this part. So in order to allow your Spark, so how it works? Yeah. So uh, you run Spark submit. Spark submit goes to a Kubernetes scheduler and API server, then, you know, API server understands from the parameters that I need to spin up some driver inside pod, I need to spin up some executor inside pod. And in order to do that, in order to actually allow, uh, drive, because the driver will actually um, be responsible for spinning up the, 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 um, the, the uh, executor pod, uh, in order to do, to do that, you need to enable Role-based access security it is done with two simple lines of code here, uh, and yeah, it is with three. Yeah. Uh, with two and adding one to the uh, to the configuration, and it will be basically so you will be done. Kubernetes will allow you to you know create pods to uh, work with Kubernetes cluster normally because without those two, you will uh, you will you will get errors that you do not have permissions and you know, some pods are not permitted to do something, yeah? Mm, yeah, also I just wanted to show you this section about future work. So not everything is, as I said, is available as for now. Um, they already did some major improvements from, uh, you know, 2.3 and 2.4 because there were, uh, there was much more, much more items here. So uh, right now, two like two crucial parts that are not implemented. Uh, uh, first of all, is it is um, dynamic resource allocation and external shuffle service, and the second one is just just you know this job queues and resource management. But I believe the most crucial part is this one because it actually does not allow to uh, dynamically uh, do the auto scaling, and as it is done, you know, within, for example. Uh, if we talk about Yarn or Mesos, yeah, uh, because um, uh, if if we talk about so two words on that, if we talk about Spark uh, on Yarn, um, it could use external shuffle services service. So you know while Spark does all the you know tasks, uh, it generates shuffle files which should be stored somewhere. Yeah, and this external shuffle service is actually used for that. Uh, so you might understand that um, uh, at the 
you know, each 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 time within within job that you know some resources that are not consumed will be just released by Spark because though those resources will not hold any information that will fail the job. Yes. So, for example, some executor um, stop uh, executing the task. Then I don't know another stage of the job required less resources, and this exec executor could be released. Yeah. With Kubernetes, it could not work like that because external shuffle services is not enabled, and shuffle files are stored within actual ports. Yeah, and you could not, unfortunately, evict your pod, executor pod, uh, because it will just fail your job. Yeah, because it stores some shuffle information, and uh, there is some soft uh, dynamic. Uh, allocation available right now. So whenever shuffle files are uh, released from this executor, yeah, uh, executor is also could could be also released, and uh, you know uh, Kubernetes could use those resources for whatever it needs. Yeah, but we do not talk right now about you know full dynamic way it is done on Yarn, and I believe the people are there is an issue on GitHub and people are working on that. So how to actually enable it. Yes, so I believe there should be some uh, actual, you know, difference in the core architecture for, for how Spark works underneath, under the hood to enable this feature. Mm, okay, so if we talk about really simple job, it looks like that. So you need to download your Spark, um, you need to download your Spark um, distribute, uh, distribution, yeah. Um, I already did this, um, yeah. And you, you know, you run regular Spark submit when, with some strange parameters that are actually valu valuable for um, for Kubernetes. So, for master, you should, uh, you know, uh, pass this Kubernetes cluster um, uh, URL. Yeah. For deploy mode, it could be client or cluster. Today, we'll concentrate mostly on cluster. Um, and yeah, some parameters that are actually uh, related to overall Spark, like you know this class or configuration of executor instances, yeah. And some parameters are only dedicated for Kubernetes, yeah. So there's a whole bunch of those parameters available here, and those control how your pod within Kubernetes will be. Most of them control how your pod within Kubernetes will be will be spin up. Yeah. Let's move on to uh, to Azure. So within Azure, I have resource group created for uh, for this demo. Yeah, um, two crucial parts of this uh, resource group are those two: so AKS cluster and um, container registry. So uh, AKS cluster is actually Azure Kubernetes Services cluster with some node pool underneath. So I know that right currently three nodes are working. So I have three nodes available for my you know, uh, Spark jobs to run computations. Uh, underneath this uh, node pool, there is actually a, a virtual machine scale set uh, created in a separate resource group. And why it is important? Because if you have a system when you want to run your Spark, um, like, I don't know, only once per day, and then you want to pause it, it is not recommended, but it is possible. Yeah, I did this. It is working. Yeah, normally. So whenever you do not need your uh, uh, Kubernetes cluster, you could not pause it from AKS um, layout. Let's say, yeah. However, you could pause it from this layout of scale set. Yeah. So we could just go to the scale set, pick stop, and you will no, no longer pay for those uh, virtual machines. Uh, so it is a way of uh, you know, saving money if you do not need those uh, this cluster, you know, running all the time. And um, yeah, Kubernetes um, work closely with uh, Docker, uh, and um, actually Azure provides container registry as a Docker repository. So I could, um, you know, hold. You could see I have a couple of repositories, and I could hold all my images of Spark. Here, so I tested different, as you see. So I have a uh, number of images there, so my uh, Kubernetes cluster could connect to this um, uh, to this container registry, 
uh, pick up a uh, Docker file with, uh, with Spark image and uh, yes, run my Spark job. Uh, before we are going to the machine itself, uh, let me just quickly clear the infrastructure and I will show it um, uh, to you how it, uh, how it is going to work. Um, yeah, okay. Um, cool. So yeah, I have connection to virtual machine uh, and I have already kubectl command line installed here. So kubectl is a command line interface to interact with your Kubernetes cluster. I could just get all the pods that are right now spinned up inside my uh, default namespace. Um, yeah, and um, what is also important here, I just wanted to mention before I actually run the job, that um, if you go to the documentation itself, uh, it actually describes how to build your um, Kubernetes image, which is really important uh, because uh, from like my end and my perspective, I used like stock image, which was not actually customized by anything. So I just went and executed those two commands and added, you know, just uh, Python binding uh, to it. And it was it. Uh, after that, I pushed my image into my container registry, as I said, and you know, so this image is hosted here. Yeah, uh, I already did this, and in order to run our job, I will execute the following command. So um, yeah, as you might see, it is pretty similar to what is done, you know, to what is shown in the documentation. So I'm executing Spark submit. Uh, I have, you know, Spark submit inside this virtual machine. Uh, I have some master URL, or URL of my AKS cluster. I am mentioning deploy mode. Uh, I am mentioning some name for this pod and uh, some other parameters that are available for my execution. So, you know, namespace where this pod, pod should be uh, executed and stuff like that. And yeah, uh, also, by the way, so this is, as you see, the container registry image. Or where uh, you know Spark job should go and uh, pull those uh, pull, pull those containers to actually uh, get this image with Spark to, to run the job. Yeah, and last one is my file with simple PI example program, which is hosted inside Azure Blob for simplicity as well. Uh, yeah, let me quickly show it to you. So. Um, I will right now uh, execute in the second window uh, watching of my pods. And after I execute this command, uh, here I will start um, receiving some, you know, logs. And here, as you see, um, I so execution of this command created two resources. Yeah. So first of all, it's created a driver program, a driver pod. Uh, so uh, with driver uh, program inside it, and after that it uh, created a uh, executor, executor, yeah, because I mentioned that I need only one executor. So after executor finished, it was terminated, and job is completed right now. So if I, uh, yeah, let me just go back and see here. So Spark submit outputs some logs, as you might see. Um, there is some slight issue with Spark submit for Kubernetes because it does not output proper exit code. So if your job fails, it still uh, gives you exit code um, zero. So you know, right now my program completed successfully at zero, but if I execute some job with mistake, it will be still zero. So I, I also found a workaround how to um, how to work with it. Mm, and yeah, and what is important here, if uh, I will check on my mm, pods right now, as you might see, my driver is completed. So my executor was completed and it was terminated. And my driver is completed and it is like hanging here. Why it is like that? Because uh, Spark says that you might want to go and check your logs for your driver. Yeah, so it does not actually terminate. So it does not like, you know, delete the pod with the driver. So you could, uh, after the pod is executed and job is executed, you could go and check your logs. 
So, and it will output the whole, you know, uh, stack trace of, of your Spark uh, job depending on, on your log4j properties, yeah? And also you could see like, you know, the result of your program here, like PVP roughly, so uh, it was calculated properly. So, um, yeah, it is like the simplest way of, you know, executing Spark in Kubernetes. Um, here I believe that, um, yeah, let me just check out whether uh, I covered everything. Yeah, I believe, yeah. So sometimes the way that I showed to you is, <laughs> I, I, I met somewhere the definition like a vanilla way. So, you know, you are going through the documentation by yourself. You do not do, use any custom uh, resource definition on any kind of custom resources. So you, you know, you, all, you, all, you use all the stock uh, methods and all the stock algorithms to do your job. Mm, but yeah, I'm like, you know, I'm using it, it is working correctly, so I'm fine with it. Uh, let's move on to integration with Azure. Um, yeah, and uh, if we go back to the architecture right, right, right now, yeah, so uh, there are three points of integration, like the most crucial ones. First of it, first of it is um, Number three, integration with Azure File Storage. And number four, integration with Azure Data Lake. And number five, integration with Secrets. Uh, so there are a number of ways that you could do this integration. And this is kind of crucial thing because, uh, you know, it, it all depends on your on your purpose, on your needs, yeah? Uh, if we talk with about AWS, without, about Azure Data Lake, there are actually a couple of ways. The most simplest way is just add two jars to the conflict. Uh, to the conflict. So two jars that are required for proper work of Azure Data Lake um, library are, um, uh, where is it? I will show it to you. So those are those two. So open SSL for some reason, I did not debug it why OpenSSL is required and Hadoop Azure. So you could just download it from your uh, Hadoop 3.2.1 distribution, those two jars, place it to your uh, storage where you host dependencies and it will be it. However, there is a second way of doing it. And the second way is actually, you know, it is a top result in Google. So if I, you know, check out Spark and Azure Data Lake Gen 2, it will be the second link for me at least, yeah. Uh, and here it is described how to do it with uh, Hadoop free, uh, Hadoop free uh, distribution of Spark and additional Spark, additional Hadoop distribution, which will be separate, yeah. I do not recommend this way to anybody because I really struggled with it. I really struggled then to create proper Docker image to my Spark submit uh, because Spark submit also also needs those libraries for some reason mm, and yeah there is a huge bunch of you know things that uh, that that are actually very very complicated with this path so I encourage to actually use those two jars uh, whenever it is possible and they work and it will be basically it yeah. Um, yeah, and one more thing to to mention is, yeah, so pro it is provided by Hadoop 3.2, thus we require Spark 3.0. I know that it is possible to uh, mix up your Spark uh, with custom uh, Hadoop distribution, because uh, if you might uh, check uh, Spark 2.4 uh, is only available with pre-built Hadoop, uh, I, I remember correctly, 2.0 something 2.4 probably I don't remember exactly so anyway it is not uh, it is not 3.2 so 3.2 is available only starting from spark 3 3.0 and you are able to build those custom mixing ups when you you know download your spark without Hadoop and just add Hadoop separately but I also checked out over the internet people are claiming that you know libraries start, stop working because there is some you know dependency uh, mixing up issue. So I just, you know, try to use the official uh, distribution, which is Spark 3.0 with Hadoop 3.2, yes, it was it. 
And uh, last last thing is POSIX versus key. So um, if you know uh, about uh, Azure Data Lake Gen 2, yeah, so you could um, you could basically grant your access to it in two ways. You, you could use key, which is kind of not very secure because you know key is a root key for your whole uh, you know account or your uh, whole like mm, you know mm, Azure Data Lake uh, container service, yeah, and um, Azure Data Lake, sorry, uh, yeah, Azure Data Lake service, yeah, and. Um, it is the best practice to actually use um, uh, uh, um, role-based access security plus uh, POSIX permissions. So role-based access security means that you create some service intensity or service principle within Azure AD, and then you grant access, access to this service principle or service identity within your Azure Data Lake. So uh, you have granular understanding that you know this service principle has access to only these folders not the whole container not the whole folder but only those uh, folders that are required and uh, yeah you, you could use you know this azure um, add the preview ad preview uh, in, in integration so uh, you know you could utilize um, some service principle or managed identity created within uh, Azure AD and uh, it, it, will it will work totally fine for you, yeah? Uh, if we talk about integration with files, so why we need integration with files? Because files are one of the um, storage classes that are possible to mount to your pod to actually allow your pod to consume information from this storage, yeah? Uh, so from the beginning, Storage class is a kind of you know abstraction on different definitions uh, of storages within uh, Kubernetes. For example, storage class could be Azure Files or Azure Disk or Google Cloud um, uh, Storage or S3 Bucket or whatever. Uh, if we talk about mount, it is a mm, it is a pointer to your pod that you could go use this storage class. To actually mount it as a you know external storage, so you could read and you know do your I/O operations with the storage. Yeah, and with files, it is possible to do it with a native storage class, which is shown here. So this is Azure file, which is nat native storage class provided natively by uh, Kubernetes. However, the issue with Spark is that if we go back to the um, documentation, uh, sorry. If we go back to the documentation of Spark, uh, and we'll go to uh, volumes, there are only three volumes that are allowed by um, config Spark configuration. Right now, we just talk about plain Spark configuration, yeah? So one is hold pass, MTD will not concentrate to, today on that. And the third one is persistent volume claim. So as you might see, there is no like, I don't know, if somebody is aware of how Kubernetes works, there is no config map. Uh, there is secret, but it is a different uh, parameter for that. Mm, there are no also storage classes like, I don't know, uh, for Azure files, for SP backend and whatever. So the only way how to uh, mount your Azure files to your pods will be create additional abstraction over your, uh, over your storage. This additional abstraction is called uh, persistent volume and persistent volume claim. So uh, I will, um, I could show it right now how it is created. So persistent volume and persistent volume claim is created like that. So persistent volume, it, it could be treated as a uh, chunk of resources. You see, so you see, it is like limited by you know number of gigabytes. And persistent volume claims, it could be treated like you know like this. Uh, hey, I want to use those resources, like, like you know, in this Kubernetes work, like pot, but, you know, for storage, yeah, so I want to use from those 10 gigabytes, uh, like, yeah, full, full 10 gigabytes, yeah, and uh, with persistent volume and persistent volume claim, you will be able to mount uh, your persistent volume claim created on top of Azure files to your um, Spark, uh, to your Spark pods, 
So you could use, you know, this native way of uh, configuration and it will be basically for you, yeah. I will also show it to you how it looks like uh, in, 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 in later examples. Uh, well, Dima, yeah, if we have time for that, yeah. So, um, yeah, moving forward, um, integration with Ski Vault, it is the most complex part here because um, Key Vault is not available, so Azure Key Vault is not available as a native storage class for Kubernetes. However, there is additional abstraction <laughs> created for those cases, which is called CSI driver. CSI, it is, it is container storage interface for third party plugins. And the idea behind CSI is that Kubernetes uh, development cycle is often not so frequent that development cycle for different third party libraries. Yeah, if we talk about, I don't know, some third party vendor want to provide uh, ability to access, uh, you know, resources for those third party vendor to Kubernetes, uh, it, it, you know, it, it is it is actually done to wait, you know, while Kubernetes will go through the whole development cycle and release a new version. And due to that, there is a there is a special abstraction created. So this is CSI, uh, Container Storage Interface, where you could develop standardized storage uh, using standardized classes. So you could provide access to different resources. Eh? And therefore, access to Azure Key Vault is actually provided using this uh, using CSI, which is con Container Storage Interface. Yeah. So there's a link on that. There is a link actually. This link describes how this Azure Key Vault provider works. So what should what should you do to uh, install it? So you need Helm for that. You need a couple of configuration uh, additional configuration applied to your Kubernetes cluster. And uh, after you do that, you will be able to um, uh, basically map your secret secrets and mount your secrets as volume. It is a, a kind of um, not very, uh, not very, not very, you know, intuitive subject because, you know, it, it actually uh, related to secrets. Uh, however, it is based on CSI and uh, container storage interface is mounted as a volume. So you need to mount your, uh, you need to mount your uh, inter so you need to mount your CSI to your pod before you will use it. Yeah, I will show you in a minute how how it, how it looks like. Yeah, so let's go to this demo number two. First, let's go through the um, configuration of files. So uh, if you go to um, yeah, let's start from the beginning. So let's start from integration of files. So if we talk about files, I already showed it to you. So we have this PV. Uh, and persistent volume claim uh, YAML. So this is this manifest file was I was talking about. So whenever I you know uh, pointed my kubectl, so my command line to this file, it created two persistent. It created two objects, so persistent volume and persistent volume claim. And yeah, if I go to my um, uh, to my uh, Kubernetes cluster and uh, I will get PVC, you will see that I have this. Spark PVC created some time ago, already 50 days, and PV, which is persistent volumes, also created 50 days ago. In order to do that, you need to have Azure Secret, which is kind of you know a thing that you should have actually in your cluster. Yeah. So uh, this secret, um, this secret is uh, actually used to store connection to your uh, storage to your file storage, and uh, and yeah, so um, this secret is used by persistent volume. You see this Azure secret, so persistent volume is created, uh, and you you have access to your uh, to your to your uh, Azure file storage. Yeah, uh, let's probably go and uh, check out the first demo. So the first demo is related to this simple program which is called uh, it is one more time it is pure pi however it is slightly different from what we saw previously yeah how it is different first of all we introduce a new so at least i am doing it like that yeah so uh, i need to run my spark submit somewhere yeah before that 
I use my virtual machine for it. So I, you know, run this Spark submit command and whatever, and so on and so forth. Yeah. If you talk about some automated deployments, uh, you might understand that we obviously do not have this type of resource, but we need to run our Spark submit somewhere. Yeah. So therefore, um, it will be also utilized for orchestration. Yeah. I create additional pod. Uh, which will be called like that. And this pod with, um, will be also based on the same image. However, it will actually run my Spark Summit within pod. So, you know, using this kind of implementation, I will be able to, uh, you know, implement different scenarios when I need to automatically run numbers of jobs, uh, you know, triggering them from, for example, Azure Data Factory. Yeah? So I could just, you know, uh, spin up different, you know, dozens or hundreds of pods, yeah. Uh, and within those pods, the the you know Spark submit command will run. So you know my uh, my 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 pod with the uh, Spark job will be uh, will be will be also uh, spin up. Mm, yeah. Uh, what is what is different here as well? Uh, you might see that I added. Um, Additional, additional Spark configuration uh, properties. First of all, it is uh, Spark Kubernetes driver. Uh, I mean, Spark Kubernetes driver and executor volumes. So you, you see there are four of them. And I actually refer to my persistent volume claim, which is Azure. Yeah. And I'm saying that, hey, mount this Azure persistent volume claim. So I'm referring to this. Um, ah, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Um, I'm saying that my claim name is Spark PVC, and it should be mounted as uh, with the name of Azure. It is kind of confusing, but I will show how it looks like in normal uh, in normal manifest file. And it should be mounted. So this PVC should be mounted as Azure, and the mount path should be like that. So if we, for instance, want to visualize how the how how the um, YAML file for normal pod will look like for this kind of comment, it will look like that. So it will look like, hey, go and check out for claim name with the name, uh, um, claim with the name Spark PVC, uh, make it available for me as a volume with name Azure and mount this volume Azure to this path. Yeah. So yeah, I'm just doing this, you know, using Spark configuration and Spark will do in Kind of implicitly the same commands as Kubernetes does, but you know within within the uh, within the driver driver pod. Um, okay, let's just probably quickly uh, you know shoot this um, shoot this job. So yeah, I will clear this up. The only thing that I need to probably delete the proper the previous one. Uh, it was PI demo. Uh, okay, and uh, I'm ready to to shoot. So I'm doing uh, this in the following way. In the following way, so I'm running kubectl. I'm running kubectl apply. So it is a command to uh, deploy resources to kubectl, not only pods by other different resources. So actually apply those manifest files to Kubernetes. And I'm applying this file, which is called uh, deploy py. So I have it somewhere like here. And uh, yeah, let's go and uh, shoot it. And let's go and check for pods. So as you might see, uh, there is a pod created uh, running currently. So it is called Spark Submit Pod PI Demo 2 as it is named here, based on metadata. Then it spin up a container uh, for driver program. So as, as expected, so driver program is named as, um, it is named by the application name as, as far as I remember. So Spark up PI demo with added some, you know, timestamp and driver. And then we have executor, which was executing. And then, uh, you know, executor was terminated and my both uh, containers were marked as completed. And if I go and check um, uh, 
for logs from my Spark submit, uh, so from my parent pod, I will get the same logs as I get, you know, when I run my Spark submit locally, but right now it's run within container, yeah? And if I go and check um, for uh, logs of my uh, driver program, uh, it will be basically the same. So it will still throw me the full stack trace and full work for J property, you know, work for J uh, uh, logs and, you know, also this pi result. What is what's, what, what, what will be different uh, if I go and check uh, the description uh, for this, uh, sorry. If I go and check the description of how this pod was deployed, uh, uh, deployed, yeah. So uh, this one, GPCTL, it is called described uh, pod. Mm. So here I will actually see kind of configuration with which this pod was deployed. And as you might see, there is a volume. So as expected, that my volume part PVC uh, related to persistent volume claim. And yeah, it was mounted as Azure. And, um, and yeah, so it is available C here as a mount. Yeah. So I was able using this job to, uh, so what, 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 what is actually, you know, uh, what this demo implies to, yeah. So I was able to store my job on my, on my, on my um, Google on my uh, file storage. Yes. Yeah? So if I go and show it to you, so it is inside PyJobs. So it is hosted in Azure, obviously. Yeah. And I also uh, could, at the same way, uh, could host all my libraries also in the same uh, mount. Yeah. So I actually, in this cloud file storage, I have jars, uh, jars uh, folder. And I, here what I try to do is actually I'm trying to execute the um, program with this uh, additional jars that are required for ADLS integration, yeah? Uh, however, my ADLS integration is not working. Uh, so let me just not, you know, not, you know, uh, show it to you how it works, but show how it should work, yeah? So this is the program. Uh, I have my um, storage container and I have some files folder inside it. And uh, as you might see, I'm setting a couple of Spark parameters, Spark uh, settings, yeah? Uh, and uh, those Spark settings are actually related to, uh, to uh, accessing my storage here. So here I'm saying that, hey, use uh, OAuth to authenticate, use Client creds token provider use client ID secret client secret. Those two are passed as secrets and then mm, defined as environment variables. So I could get those uh, from you know this command and uh, using this stuff uh, without any you know hard coding credentials and hard coding key and whatever. I'm able to actually go in my uh, file storage and, you know, uh, read some files over there. Yeah. What is crucial for this, uh, for this uh, program, uh, there are two things, pretty complex, I would say, but I will try to, uh, to be uh, short here. So, um, first of all, it is template. Uh, so templates were introduced with Spark 3.0 and templates allow you to actually define different Spark configuration, uh, different Kubernetes configuration properties, which are not defined by Spark. So if we refer to the documentation one more time, uh, there is a possibility that you will, you know, describe all your properties uh, as Spark parameters and also you will, you could you know, create this um, template with some different properties that Spark will also use, yeah? So for that, I'm using template, which looks like that. And with template, I'm trying to mount my um, CSI storage class created previously for, you know, syncing those keyword secrets 
And I'm also mounting uh, this storage class as a volume, and I'm also passing um, secrets, uh, values, and secret keys to my environment variables. Uh, probably I will skip the part how it is done. If somebody is interested, I will you know guide you through in the very details. I will not, also not shoot this code because unfortunately it was working for me. But with this kind of a setup, so with this um, additional um, CSI driver with um, with a template and uh, also you know Spark configuration which says that hey go and check this uh, hey go and check this template somewhere it is uh, it is so uh, here here go and check for this template it is possible to mount those secrets as environment variables and also pass those jars as dependencies so we'll be able to normally directly connect to your ashram.la and read your files from there and do all the operations you require uh, yeah, so uh, I believe this is it for demo number two. I think that we are, you know, running out of time. I have a couple of other subjects, but but yeah, I believe that for today it will be because it, I already covered a number of stuff. So yeah, as you know, uh, the other the, the last part I also implemented it. Just yeah, trust me. Uh, I will probably you know shoot it and then we will come to questions and after that uh, I will just show you the result yeah so I implemented the orchestration here yeah, of uh, between spark uh, and Azure data factory so I did this using webhook functionality in Azure functions uh, if somebody is interested in you know actual implementation I will guide you through it and um, how it is working the first activity you, you might understand the Azure Data Factory so it's code free orchestration tool yeah so my first activity uh, what it does it actually goes and checks for configuration so I'm trying to right now be even more um, even more uh, flexible and you know store my, my configuration within the file yeah so obviously I could you know define those configuration of some some of the spark defaults but some of them will be job related yeah so Right now, all my job related configuration is, in, is stored inside file. And after that, I'm shooting uh, a request to my, um, to my, to my uh, Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so it executes uh, pods. And uh, you might see that, you know, it's actually running some program, which is Python P. So it is this, this simple program, which executes PY execution uh, and uh, calculation. And yeah, I'm able to pass my status back to Azure Data Factory to return the message with my driver pod name. And the, the second thing, which was related to this exit code issue, I was also able to overcome this. And uh, I created a, you know, a script with checks for actual exit code of Spark job and returns proper exit code. So if everybody, anybody is interested, I believe it is valid not only for Azure, it is valid for all, you know, Kubernetes uh implemented everywhere so it is the common issue some somehow not resolved by spark but yeah i created a kind of workaround for that so you know it for the failed job i could see that it is an error and uh after the error is here i could see that error was also shoot out to my return to my azure yeah um i believe this is it sorry it took a bit longer i didn't cover everything Mm, I will try to, you know, fulfill the presentation with all the links, with all valuable readings and all the links I used to prepare for this, uh, to this presentation. And yeah, I will probably, you know, uh, provide you with a link to my GIF repository where I store all those code snippets. Uh, it is kind of messy, but uh, I will try to actually organize it a bit within a uh, couple of uh, weeks so there will be some you know more clear clear and precise descriptions and instructions how to use some of you know code, code snippets how to do some you know demo what i was done uh, what was done on the demo by yourself um and yeah so basically this is it uh, any questions to any part
Hi, uh, Gleb, thank you so much for uh, sharing it and um, showing all these details. It's really uh, not so easy to jump uh, fully uh, because you've spent so much time to uh, come up with all that granular um, things. So, yeah, uh, the question uh, is, uh, uh, is this uh, demo that you are showing, uh, is it like a part of the project that you were implementing or it was like more research and um, you were uh, you were interested in how to make it work? It, it is, uh, yeah, thank, for, thank you for the question. So it is partially uh, research and partially based on the project. So the whole overall architecture is based part of it, at least on the project itself. So I know that guys uh, have integration with ADLS and I, with Azure, Azure Data and files. However, they did their orchestration within Kubernetes uh, in the same way as I am doing it. So, you know, they created a pod which uh, was running Spark Submit, but it was just orchestrated with an airflow. So uh, using their approach, I only just added this integration with Azure Data Factory. So you could, you know, use this code free tool not to, you know, add additional complexity with, you know, this airflow if, for example, you are not comfortable with or if you have already Spark, you know, Azure Data Factory you want to work, continue to work with. And also, I would say that uh, they, for they, so the, the organization was like, uh, they were working for banking and they had the compliance requirement to have a separate, so they have this multi-tenant scenario that they wanted to have a separate cluster for each client and each client would have like number of jobs and you know, there was like two hundreds of jobs, uh, sometimes bigger, sometimes smaller, but all of them were Right, written in Spark, and they had about 100 clients. So they used, uh, you know, um, data bricks. I believe not the proper way because they tried to spin up, you know, a cluster for each job. And data data bricks was claiming that it, you know, it's like in resources actually because there is a limit for data bricks to, you know, the number of nodes and clusters to be created. So they looked into Kubernetes, and it actually worked for them. They created the POC, and they were really happy. So I believe right now it is working on production for them. And they also use more, you know, complex objects, which is like, you know, this auto scaling, for example, I know that they use it. Uh, I, you know, actually provided them with this exit code issue resolve for resolve it for them. And yeah, so it is partially based on their experience, like eight, like 70%. Yeah. And for, for what you might understand, you know, you might have in Azure or in different cloud services, different implementations of your Spark cluster. So you have, I know, EMR or like, you know, Hadoop implementation, you have, you could have Databricks, and, you know, with this Kubernetes implementation, it is really fine and it is really handy if you have like scenarios with, with you know, which was mentioned like multi-tenancy, like different clients need to have separate clusters, yeah. So using these abstractions, using those pods uh, resources inside Kubernetes, it is really, really super easy to, to do that, yeah? The same is about some, I don't know, customized deployments, yeah? If you want really, really highly customized solution, I believe uh, you'll be able to build it with Kubernetes in a quicker way, yeah? If we talk about, you know, some some general scenarios where when to use those Kubernetes or Spark with Kubernetes versus uh, Spark on, on, on something else. Thank you. Yes, it's yes. a common common uh, task to implement something like that. So very yep. insightful. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. And yeah, also a kind of quick comment. So I didn't cover it in too much details, but yeah, there is a Spark. Uh, uh, Google operator, yes. So I know that uh, guys from SoftSurf worked on the project. I don't remember the, the, the last name, so it was Victor. I don't remember the last name. So he worked with Google Spark operator. Uh, it is a custom resource and it adds additional complexity. So it is, you know, a step up with this kind of a different way of doing Kubernetes on, uh, on doing Spark on Kubernetes, which could be also um, helpful if you have, you know, some scenarios. So if you, for example, want some further, I think you could read on, you know, about this Google. Uh, it is actually, you know, described very good in the presentation. I will show it. I will share it with you. So, uh, you know, how those Spark Submit and Spark on KS operator, you know, 
the, the differ from each other and what are the best implementations for each of them. So, uh, you know, there are different ways of how you are going, how you could actually to, you know, use uh, Spark on, on Kubernetes. Yep. Any, any other questions? Uh, sorry, maybe I missed uh, uh, which version of Spark it covers. So it covers the latest Spark 3 or it works on the 2.0 versions currently that which you show? Uh, yeah, it was all based on 3.0. <laughs> the interesting fact that yesterday I tried to actually pull up 3.0.1 because there was some fixes applied in September. But for some reason there was some issues while spinning executor pods because I, you know, scaled up Kubernetes cluster to like five nodes and I had only one application that was constantly claiming that, it, you know, there is a lack of resources. So I believe this, the newest version, which is 3.0.1, is <laughs> could actually not work. And I, uh, I encourage you, if you want to test something, to use, you know, stable 3.0.0. Great, thanks.